Happy Sunday, fam. Good to see everybody in church. So glad that you are part of our worship experience today. What a great time in church we've already had. We are going to continue our series today, as you just heard. We love talking about relationships. It's been a great, great season. Speaking of relationships, um, during the last six months of this crazy season, we've had over 600 people make a decision to follow Jesus in their life. Come on, isn't that awesome? Over 600 people. And so as a church, we're, we're helping, trying to help people move forward in those relationships. If you're one of those 600, we want you to know there are next steps for you. And one of those is baptism, water baptism. Next Sunday, we're going to be doing that as our family of churches. And so you can get signed up to do that. We want to celebrate that. It's really the, when we talk about following Jesus, the example he has for our life, this is one of those examples he gave us to to model, and that is being baptized. It's our public declaration of something that's happened inside of our hearts. Uh, And so we would love to celebrate as your family with your church family. So I hope to be a part of that with you next week. Water baptisms. Hey, as we've been talking about relationships, how to navigate this season well in our relationships or just life in general, how do we keep our relationships healthy? How do we do this thing called life right with the the people that are in our life? And I can tell you for our home, it's no different. We have been trying to navigate this season, learning new ways to stay connected, new ways to do relationships. My wife and I, we have a a toddler. His name is Paxson. He's uh, not quite two yet. He will be two soon. And he is full on pedal to the metal, let me tell you. And uh, during this season, we haven't been able to travel. My wife's also pregnant, seven and a half months pregnant. So traveling has not been an option for us right now. Grandparents haven't been coming to to be safe. And uh, so we've had to be creative on how we stay connected. And one of those ways is FaceTime. And both of our phones have this, this distinct ring that when FaceTime calls are happening, my son has learned this and he hears it. So when he hears the FaceTime ring, he literally will come running from any corner of the home and he starts just rattling off the list of all of his grandparents' names because he knows FaceTime means we're going to talk to one of the grandparents. So literally the, the ring starts happening and it's, he says, uh, grandma, papa, mamma, me, me, papa. He just starts making stuff up. Like he just goes in. It's like a lottery for him. He just, he, he literally gets to the phone and it's ringing and he just stands there grinning. And then whichever one pops up, it's, you know, it's, it's so cool. So much so that we've had to adapt. He's now learning how to be affectionate through technology. He's, he's perfected the FaceTime kiss. So all of his grandparents will say, give me kisses. And this is what they get right here. The kiss. He starts off with that, that long hum. And it's a crescendo. It says, it's his big moment to kiss. Now for mom and dad, we have to clean our phones a couple times a day, a lot on the weekends, but uh, it's a cool, the phone sticks to your ear, you know, it's like, oh, he's been FaceTiming grandma again. But it's how we've been doing life. We've adapted. We are trying to continue to navigate well in our relationships. And we've talked over the last few weeks um, just how to do that and do it right. God has a plan for our relationships, even the relationships that stretch us and challenge us. Even the relationships that seem a little difficult in our life. A few, a several, a few years ago, I was teaching some thoughts on this, and uh, there's actually a publisher uh, in the audience, and we ended up doing a book uh, for Lifeway Books, and several other places picked it up called How Do I Deal with Difficult People? And so uh, this book has stirred a lot of great conversations with family and friends. And so uh, I've, I carry it around. I keep it in my office. It's, uh, I never thought my first book would be about dealing with difficult people, but as a pastor, pray for me. Anyway, <laughs> but the, well, I'm going to share a few thoughts about this because what I have found is that God uses people in our lives to, for his purposes and plans to be revealed to us. I'll say it like this. God uses people to shape us into the person for the purpose he has for our life. In any season, it can be the long, big purpose, it can be the purpose for this season. God uses people to develop us, to shape us. I can say it like this. God used difficulty to develop spiritual fruit in our life. Even if it's people that we do like, sometimes it's people that we don't like. (laughs) But for me personally, I have found the ones that I try to avoid the most are the ones that are most effective in shaping some God things in my life. 
Because it causes me to deal with hard things. It causes me to deal with emotions that, that I, I can let get out of control sometimes. My prayers usually in these kind of situations or these relationships go a little bit like this. God, if you would just move them to Alaska, everything would be really good. <laughs> like Texas, Alaska, that's far enough, I think. Yeah, that's right. But then it's like God almost responds back. Well, you're trusting me like you haven't trusted me in a while with your life. You're talking to me more than you've talked to me in a quite a while. You are practicing self-control in some areas that's been running loose for a little while. If I was God for me, I would be saying, ha ha, keep praying. I'm here. I'm listening. I got you. But you got, you're, going, you're in this for a little while. I like what's happening in your heart. I like the person you're becoming. You're learning to be in this difficult situation. And I can tell you that it's not always fun But it's always been worth it when I've allowed the Holy Spirit to work in my life, to shape me, to create in me the person he wants me to be. I wish it was just an easy download. I wish it would be like a pop-up on your your computer and it just says, update, download. Just click it. You wake up in the morning and it's done, you know? It's like, but it doesn't happen that way. God uses people to develop his purposes in our heart, his plans in our life. And so... For you, I want you to know today, we're going to talk through a couple practical things. Jesus has given us a model for how to handle difficult relationships, difficult people, prickly personalities, if you will. People who, who send, tend to just get us just the right way and how we respond in those ways. In those. Let me set you up for a win. I'm going to ask you a question, all right? This is not a time to clear your throat. Don't adjust your seat posture right now, okay? But look straight ahead. Don't answer out loud. Do you have a difficult person in your life right now? Oh, oh, there's a little more laughter than I thought. (laughs) Nervous laughter. (laughs) No. Praise the Lord, Brian. That's great. (laughs) Darling. (laughs) Great. Hey, we all have, we all have relationships that can tend to, and listen, the one that, that's, we thanked God for two months ago, could, the relationship, that relationship could be the one we're talking to God about right now, but it's Okay. It's part of the process. Jesus had difficult people. He had problem people in his life too. This particular group I want to talk about were the Pharisees. They were always, they always had some angle they were trying to get at Jesus. They always were looking for opportunities to try to call him out, to ruffle his feathers, if you will. And I want to take a look at a situation he was walking through with this group, a couple from this group, a couple of folks, and we're going to extract some principles I feel like will really help you in dealing with difficult people. Let's check this out. Luke chapter six says, one Sabbath day as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples broke off heads of grain, rubbed off the, rubbed off the husk in their hands and ate the grain. But some Pharisees said, the Pharisees, nothing was ever fair, you see. Help you out there. <laughs> Why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus replied, haven't you read in the scriptures? What David did when he and his companions were hungry, he went into the house of God and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priest can eat. He also gave some to his companions. And Jesus added, and just throw this in at the end there, the son of man is Lord, talking about himself, even over the Sabbath. Now listen, this authority right here that he has, this is enough for him to have put them in their place to come right out of the gates. Don't you know who I am? Back off, pal. Like, don't come with me. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Like, don't come at me with that, right? He had the opportunity to come in strong right out of the gate. But I love the example he gave us. So gracefully, so masterfully, he showed us how to handle people who are problems in our life, who tend to be the ones who pop up when we least expect it. And it caused us to really be stretched. He did this with such grace and security. I want us to talk a little bit about that. And when we have these moments where a problem person, a prickly personality is in our life, oh, here's your first response. Instead of starting off with that, hey, back up. What if we started like this? Let's just be gracious. Let's be gracious. Let's, Let's approach the scenario. Let's approach them with a sense of grace in our hearts. You know, do you know that you can be 100% wrong? I mean, take that back. Yes, you can be. You can be 100% right 
and deal with something 100% wrong. You can have the right, you can have all the right material and present it totally in the wrong way. Being gracious sets you up to win. It puts you in a posture, it puts them in a posture to receive the same way. Is I love that Jesus, instead of coming heavy fisted, he said, okay, I'm gonna assume the best. I'm gonna try to help them understand. Here's a good principle for you if you're gonna learn to be gracious in your relationships. Don't make any assumptions. Don't react or respond out of assumptions. And if your heart can't help it, you've gotta assume something. Assume the very best. Assume that they didn't show up to wreck your day or to ruin your week. Assume the best that they probably have something going on in their life that maybe you don't know about. Maybe they don't know that you're sensitive to the topic they just brought up. Assume the best. And that's what Jesus did. He began to ask them questions. Say, hey, don't you, have you read the scripture? Do you understand this? What if the next time someone rubs you the wrong way, when they get under your skin, instead of coming at them full force, you just said, hey, how's your day going? How's your week been? My wife is a master at this. In our home, I can come, I'll, I'll come home in the evenings and she could, she's been keeping up with a toddler and she's pregnant, so Lord knows what her day's probably been like. And I could be in a, I'll come home and in a conversation, this is my cue. She goes into gracious mode. When I've carried something in and I'm working through something in my mind and I, oh, I've had a, a heavy day, I'm like, oh, I'm carrying some things. I, she can tell when I'm responding out of that. And so now she'll just say, it's usually something like this. In the middle of conversation, she just stops, looks at me. How was your day? That's my cue. Oh, no. I'm operating out of something she had nothing to do with. I'm, I'm putting something on her that she, she didn't even know existed. And so I have to stop and say, oh, it was interesting. <laughs> it was a peculiar day. And so that's our cue. That's our way of just saying, okay, look, you know, we got to be gracious in this. I got to, I've got to, and I appreciate that about her because she could, there are times when I come in and I'm, I'm carrying these things. She could come right back at me. Well, who do you think you are? Talk. Instead, she, she does it so gracefully. Hey, are you, are you good? Do you, have you, are, sometimes she even said, like Jesus, have you read the scriptures? <laughs> no. <laughs> have you talked to God today? Be gracious. It puts us in a posture to really begin to move forward in a healthy, on a healthy foot. It begins to make, make, a, make the heart feel receptive opposed to rejecting what may come next. Our, our responsibility is to, to recognize those moments and be gracious. I love how Jesus did that. And then at the end, he threw in that, but I'm, just so you know, I am the son of man, the Lord of the Sabbath. Like there's this confidence. It's like he, he could have led out with that, and just said, this is who I am. This is... Instead, he was gracious, but yet he also demonstrated a sense of security. In these moments, you gotta be gracious, but you also gotta be secure in yourself. If you're not secure in yourself, you'll find yourself being insecure, and that puts you on the defense. That causes walls to go up, and it causes us to get defensive, and, and we wanna defend our stance and defend our opinion or our attitude. What we have to do is we have to pull back, be gracious, and then check our heart. Okay, I need to make sure I'm not letting this in my heart. Is there something, am I operating out of a hurt or a disappointment right now? Am I, make, am I allowing their issue to become my issue? Here's some great wisdom for you in Proverbs chapter four. I love this verse. It's one of our life verses at our, around our house. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. If you don't guard it, you're gonna let anything in there. You're going to let someone else's issues, their hurts, their disappointments become yours. And next thing you know, you're going to be responding out of that. And the course of that conversation or that course of that interaction is going to, might take a wrong turn. I remember uh, several years ago I, in going through some of these notes, I, I remember this incident I was walking through with this family. Uh, again, many years ago, nobody in the Life Family Church, it's just so you know, nobody. And we were talking through uh, some situations and, and they had this, they had this, the potential each and every time to go to, for their attitude to go south. And it was just like, it was something coming into the conversation I knew existed, but I was trying to help be a problem solver. And we were talking through the scenario. And as we began to talk through the, the situation, 
man, I just, they, the negativity, and then it turned into just like this, this arrogance and the pride, and it was just like, it was so clear that they weren't taking ownership, and they were, you know, they were just getting wound up, and they, it, I felt, I, I was trying to help solve, but it, all of a sudden, it, it felt like they were coming at me, and it was like, whoa, whoa, like, how do we, and, and next thing I knew, family, I was on the edge of my seat. I had white knuckles on the front of my chair. I had my feet in this. I was ready to launch. I was just like, I could feel the old man rising up inside of me. The one that I said, God, I don't want to be that man anymore. I felt him creeping back in my hood. And I was like, oh, get out. You got to go. And listen, no more in that moment. I was, I was ready. I, literally, I could feel myself bubbling. And, and, and again, I had nothing to do with this situation. But I was so emotionally got involved and wrapped up in that. I was ready. I was in attack mode. And no more than, as real rather, as I'm talking to you now, I heard this, this in my heart. White knuckles on the edge of the seat, fired up. Pride provokes pride. I don't like that. Say something else. <laughs> I wanted to hear something else. I wanted like a charge, you know, something like that, you know, like <laughs> release the secret weapon. I was ready. Anything other than pride, provoking pride. And all of a sudden I found myself release my grip. I felt the back of the chair hit my back, slid back. I was breathing better. And I just realized I had begun to take that on. And the pride and the arrogance and the anger in which they were communicating, all of a sudden I found it, I myself adopting that as my own attitude and my own feeling and emotion. And I did not, I was not guarding my heart like I'm talking to you today. Instead, instead then of charging, <laughs> releasing the secret weapon, instead I was able to be gracious and I began to ask them some questions. And I began to talk to them about this scenario and added value to the situation and before it was over with, I shared with them, hey, did you know that pride provokes pride? Make sure that the scenario you're walking through, there's not something in them that's pulling out something bad in you. And you, oh man, it was a beautiful moment. And when I felt like I walked away from there, I thought, wow, God, I won that situation. I won, of all the losses, I mark one up, I get to win one, right? I was so glad that I won that, that situation. What you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you stay secure and confident in the person that you want to be, that God wants you to be, so that you don't lower your standard in a moment of emotion, in a moment of emotion. You know, as we talk through a scenario like this, like, okay, I can pull that off once, but what happens? What do you do if it keeps happening? Well, let's talk about that. Jesus did the same thing. He knew what it happens when they come back again. In fact, the next verse in chapter six, verse six, it says this. It says, on another Sabbath... He went into the synagogue. He was teaching. And, and then it says that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now listen, healing someone, I would, I would venture to say if we pulled the audience would say that's not a bad thing. But they were so determined to look for a reason to accuse him, to accuse him of something wrong, that they would use something right to try to make it wrong. How, how complicated is that, right? How, how backwards is that? Well, this is what was happening. So here's what you've got to know. There's gonna, there may be, even if you win that moment, there may be another, another opportunity for you to come. And here's what, in my life, I look back, the another's typically come more often than I, than I wanted them to. So I realized, okay, I need to put together a long-term plan, <laughs> Being gracious one time, being secure one time is easy to pull a one off. But what if I have to live there? What if I have to stay in control of my emotions? What if I have to continually walk out the fruit of the Spirit in this relationship? I want to give you, I want to give you some wisdom that, that I've learned. Uh, so just some tips, some handles to hold on to uh, when you have another opportunity to keep, the, keep facing the another right. First thing is uh, you got to stay patient. Stay patient. You can't, get, you, you can't let your emotions push you into a, a fast and fury kind of moment, furious moment. You've got to stay patient. You've got to make sure that you harness yourself. 
in such a way that you are demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. I love this verse, some good wisdom for you here in Proverbs. Better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer. Jesus, why didn't you just come out and show your authority, put them in their place? Because patience is better than power. It's better to have self-control than to, con- to, than to conquer a city. It's better to be in control of yourself than show how dominant you can be in that moment. Here's a convicting moment for me. Domination is not a godly discipline. Domination is not us saying, that's not a fruit of the Spirit. It's not me saying, I'm going to put them in their place. or who did This is a, me saying, I'm going to allow God to work in this situation. I'm going to... I'm going to slow my roll. I'm going to gather myself. I'm going to show self-control. I I don't have to conquer them. I just have to conquer me. I have to be in control of me, and this situation is going to turn out good. Amen? Here's some more wisdom for you. James chapter 1. I love this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Human anger, our anger, our frustration does not produce the righteousness God desires. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about if we will allow God, he will produce righteousness, his righteousness in our heart. If we allow him to work through a difficult situation, a a challenging relationship, God will produce, but not the anger part doesn't. It's the patience that produces in our life, produces spiritual. Patience is a producer, not a punisher. Patience is a producer. It produces godly things. Now, I say the word punisher because I've tried to be, quote, patient and just ignore someone. Like I'm going to show them I, what they've done and that just live with the consequences. You just have to live with this. That's not patience. (laughs) That's toleration. (laughs) And that just leads to more frustration because they're not going to go away. There's going to be another Sabbath and then another Sabbath. Are you with me? You can't can't try to punish them with your pay. It's not, it's not, that's not how it works. Patience, how you know you're really being patient is it's producing self-control, kindness and joy towards them. It's godly patience. We're not trying to punish them. We're trying to get better. We want to be better in this. We want to be bigger in the way we handle ourselves and live in life. We've got to stay patient. Another good encouragement for you, you've got to stay peaceful. You've got to stay peaceful. Gosh, it's so easy to take a stance. To take a stance, get your feet down in the sand. I shall not be moved. Instead, you've got to work to live in peace with one another. You gotta work for peace. You gotta work to get along with one another. Check out this in Hebrews 12. It says, work at living in peace with everyone. Not just the people you enjoy. Not just the people that bring you gifts. (laughs) Joy, even the ones who take your joy. (laughs) Work for peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. This is the goal, family, is that we wanna be in peace and we wanna have a godly life. We want, to be the, we want to be a godly person. We want to be a Christian. We want to be Christ-like in how we handle these scenarios. Work at living a holy life. But then watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. We have to make sure that we are working. And I want to tell you, I know it is work sometimes, y'all. <laughs> it is work sometimes just to have peace in a situation. But I want to tell you the work is worth it. On the back end, it's so rewarding. It is so fruitful to be, begin to, to, to walk out peace in a relationship, but you have to work for it. And if you're going to fight for something, fight for peace. Fight for peace in this relationship. Fight for that. Sometimes you just need to tell you, hey, you know what? I'm trying to get peace. I'm working for peace. Or, can we work together on this? Like, is there a way that we can do this? Did I miss something? Am I not doing something the right way? Feels like when I'm taking a step towards you, there's a step back and it's like, no, let's do this. And you have to make a choice to work for peace. You, it, it's a decision we make in our life to see peace.
It's God's plan for us, family. To see things, not to be, here's what the, here's what the opposite of that looks like. Anxiety, worry, striving. We don't want that. We want God's, God's peace. And we have to work for it. We have to choose peace. Listen, offense is not an event. It's a choice. Offense is not just a one-off moment. Listen, there are offendable moments that happen all the time in life. We, thank the Lord, get the choice to say, am I going to be offended or not? Am I going to let this become a root of bitterness in my heart? Or am I going to allow this to be a root of an opportunity to get better, to get bigger and how I conduct and lead myself as a godly person. I understand. I understand it's work, but it's what's expected. It's our, it's our opportunity to allow God to work in our life. You got to stay patient when the another's come. When another one comes, you got to stay peaceful and you got to stay prayerful got to stay prayerful. you got to talk to the Lord about these things. you got to let him be a part of what's happening. What does that look like? What is prayer? However you talk to God, that's being prayerful. That's your prayer. you got to talk to him. you got to invite him into the situation. In fact, that's what prayer does. Prayer invites him into the, the situation and the solution. Just this week, I was calling through a I was going through something. I was trying to work something out. And I talked to some advisors in my life. I talked to my wife. More than I'd like to admit, I talked to myself this week a lot. <laughs> and as I was preparing these notes, I literally stopped, had a moment. I went, I don't remember if I actually really invited you into this situation this week, God. I was so busy trying to solve it and work it all out that I, I realized that I was going to confess this in front of the life family today. <laughs> that I had not invited God to be a part of the solution. I asked him, God, is there something I'm missing? God, give, give, me, a, give me love for this person in this situation. Help me understand. God, give me grace for the situation. And wouldn't you know, he gave me what I was asking for. I found myself. I got a, I got a couple texts and had to work through some things. And you know what? I... I finished that and I set my phone down and I thought, wow, that was different. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that I don't have to do this alone. That the one who has the authority over the day has the authority over the hearts of men. He heard my prayer. And some of you need to hear that today. You're not in this alone. You don't have to walk this out by yourself. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. It's something that we've got to practice. Our prayers, it's just talking to God. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you one verse that you can remember when you leave here today. All right, you ready? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. I memorized it just for today. And this is what it says. Never stop praying. Next week, I'll, we'll up the ante. We'll add six words. Or just three simple words to memorize. You can do this. I did it. Pray. Never stop praying. Here's, here's my translation of it for you. Don't stop including God what's going on in your life. Don't stop talking to him about what's heavy in your heart. Don't stop telling him what's paining you and what's problemming you. Don't stop talking to him about the solution you need for the problems you're facing. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to be involved in you coming out of this, the victor. He wants you to be on the good side of this, the God side of this. He has good plans for your life. You got to include him. Never stop talking to him. It's, it's like this release valve. It's this pressure release that we get when we feel that anxiety and we feel, we feel the opposite of peace as, as we're worried and we're trying to figure out. Just stop and pray. God, help me. Sitting at the red light, sitting at your desk, laying in your bed, sitting in your favorite chair. You put yourself wherever you want to in your mind. That's where I'm going to start praying. I need to talk to God about this more. I need to include him in the solution and the situation. Amen.
God's going to move you forward and he's going to give you the strength spiritually to do what's right. He's going to give you the spiritual stamina to keep doing what's right if you'll let him. If you receive God's word today, can we thank God by giving him a hand clap of praise? Man, what a, what real talk. <laughs> so real. We're, we're all facing, listen, you don't get the privilege of seeing what I see. I see heads nodding the whole time. And yes, there was a few elbows going back and forth. In agreement, that is. Listen, you're not in this one. We're all facing these. We all face these opportunities. What this is about is winning those opportunities in a godly way, walking out God's best in our life. Looking back a year from now and saying, wow, I would never have wanted to, to go through that. But since I did, I'm so much bigger, so much better spiritually because God allowed me to go through that. I want to pray for some of you today that are most likely walking through a situation, a scenario that, that we've touched on in this message. And I'm going to believe to do what's right. For some of us, we don't even know what's around the corner. That person could be. <laughs> no, I won't go there. We want to we position our, we want to posture our hearts in a place where God can use difficult things to develop spiritual fruit in our life. Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you care enough to stir our hearts with a word that's convicting. A word that comes with guidance principle and passion in our hearts to do what's right. God, I pray that this word would not fall on deaf ears, but that, Lord, that we would take this to heart. And Lord, that this week, Lord, you would surprise us with the strength to not get, get weary in doing well, to not give up on what's right in this situation. Lord, I pray that for the difficult people in our life, Lord, that they would feel your love from us like we have felt from you. And Lord, for those who feel like giving up, I just pray fresh courage today, fresh strength to try again, to take another step. Lord, our hearts are for you to be glorified in our relationships and in our life. Why don't you just take a minute now and talk to him about your person, your situation. What, I'll give you 60 seconds. Why don't you just talk to him about that? God, I need you with this. Give me wisdom. God, I need your wisdom on this. I need grace for this person, this situation. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just declare that you're enough. Thank you that we're not alone in this, that you're right beside us. I mentioned earlier that several had given, have given their life to Jesus, had made a new beginning, a fresh start in life. There's some of you who need to make that decision today, whether you're here in person or joining us in our online congregation. You need to have a moment where you totally give it all to God. Your life, your past, your future, and you need to make a decision to follow him. Here's what the scripture simply says, that if we can believe that Jesus died for our sins, that we can confess that with our mouth, we can repent of our sins, that we can be saved, we can be rescued. The Bible calls it salvation. It's a new beginning. It's a fresh start in life. If you've never prayed that prayer, today is your day. If you've never received Jesus, you've never given complete control of your life to him. I want to tell you, friend, today is the day that he can make all things new in your life. So we're going to pray a prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer with us. Even those who've prayed it before, we're going to all pray this together. And we're going to believe that this is a faith moment for you, that God's going to give you a new beginning. Let's pray this prayer all together. Lord Jesus, 
Thank you for giving your life for me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the strength to follow you all of my days. I make you my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, we, we celebrate with you if you prayed that prayer. We hope you've enjoyed our online content. If you're not part of a local church, we want to invite you to be part of our family. Whether you're watching here in Austin or somewhere else around the globe, we consider you part of the Life family. Make sure to come back, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our new videos each week.